All right, thank you everybody for being here uh, at the uh, 2021 virtual UCGIS education session. My name is Forrest Bolick. I'm the chair of the education committee uh, and a lecturer in uh, environmental conservation, geosciences, school of public policy, data analytics and computational social science and every other program I can get my hands into at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, it's awesome to be here with everybody. Uh, I'm joined in uh, kind of co-running this today uh, by Eric Shook, the co-chair of the UCGIS Education Committee. Eric will take over if one of those lightning storms comes through and knocks me out again. If you follow me on Twitter, you saw that I was lost at the end of the lightning talks, conveniently enough, uh, this afternoon. But uh, it's I'm thinking everything is calmed down by now. So tonight's session is all about conversations. It's all about working together. It's all about kind of putting some thoughts and experiences down in a number of different documents and locations for us to just talk about how our teaching went, talk about how we, uh, uh, our classrooms went, how, you know, our students or our instructors or our colleagues or however education finds you uh, was experienced during uh, the past year and to also to plan looking ahead. You will find that I will not use the term returning to normal because we are not returning to normal. Nothing is going to be the same way that it was this, you know, this upcoming semester as it was, say, the second semester of 2019 or even the beginning of 2020, right? Nothing is going back to that. So for our future of GIS, we uh, have learned a lot of stuff, good things, bad things. And uh, this is a chance for us to connect with each other, to discuss and have those opportunities to have discussions. So throughout the night, we'll be in the big group here, we'll be in breakout groups, we'll be uh, discussing hopefully, if you're in a position where you can turn your camera on, great. If not, radio mode works just fine. Uh, and we're going to just talk and create and make things happen. So our first topic for the night uh, is we're going to use a uh, entity, a document called a note catcher. This is something I learned about uh, early on in my teaching last, uh, last August, last September. Uh, this one, and I've done interactive Google Docs before. This is a format that works really well. It's one link to share. That link's in your chat right now. You can click it. And everyone who clicks that link, I can see all you anonymous animals jumping in right now. Uh, that link will allow you to edit. I've got a couple, well, really one question with a subset in there uh, of, a, of reflecting on your successes from the past semester. What was a teaching practice you implemented, experienced, or observed? So maybe you were a student in some cases, an instructor in others, a collaborator, whatever it might be. What was a teaching practice during the pandemic influenced teaching and learning that was successful? And then after discussing that, what would others need to do or change or learn to implement it in their teaching or learning? So what's gonna happen is we're going to zip away into breakout rooms. I will come and bother you. I'll hop around and don't get quiet like students. The students always get quiet when I jump in, like I'm spying on them or something. Uh, but I will be looking at all of your notes, which is just as informative uh, and maybe making comments as well. So the way this is gonna work, you all have this note catcher link in the chat. That chat follows you into your breakout room. So you can click on it there. We're gonna divide into four groups. Or breakout rooms, your breakout room number is your group number. If you click that accept breakout room invitation too quick, it'll be in the top left of your Zoom screen once you move into that breakout room. Uh, so we'll be in there for 15 minutes or so. When we come back, I will invite everybody to uh, re respond as a group, respond uh, or report back, I should say, uh, from these different groups. Uh, and I very much look forward to hearing what you've talked about and to also, of course, looking at your notes and making comments as I go. Uh, so I've got the room set up. Any questions about what's ahead of us before we zip away into our breakout rooms here?
Seeing none, have fun in the breakout rooms. I'll stay here for a little bit to catch anybody who is late arriving. Take notes, have fun. See you back here in a little bit. So you just had some wonderful breakout rooms. I know that people were joining in here and there, popping in, popping out. Always good to have new friends pop in and out. So uh, in the, you know, just to respect the time and kind of the plans that I've got in here, I'm gonna pick on a couple of groups here to uh, report back. And I wanna start by asking group one to report back because you have fantastic notes and somehow renumbered the groups on the note catcher itself uh, to then uh, shift everything around. And I appreciate that kind of rearrangement. So group one, what did you talk about? What stood out in your conversation? Boris, we did not remember, but we did uh, have a lot of fun conversations. We adapted to the renumbering that had somehow happened. Um, so we did a round of introductions. And to be, we did go a little longer than 30 seconds, which is why I think our 15 minutes uh, went um, relatively quickly. But anyway, I think um, if uh, we were to recap and to kind of uh, filter out what was the most important thing that we talked about, it was um, to allowing students a little bit of time for non-academic chit chat, you know, so the dog and cat polls that you shared would have been super important, super useful for that kind of thing. But for example, in my course, um, I allowed them when they worked in their Zoom breakout rooms, after the academic component was done, I would live just like um, Eric Shook mentioned a little bit earlier, I would encourage them to talk about what's going on in their lives. In fact, I would oftentimes start the class and just do five to seven minutes of water cooler talk about you know what's going on, what's in the news, especially when there was something in the news that applied to the class, right? So it made it still informative, but it wasn't, you know, as structured or as academic, quote unquote. Um, the other thing that Lee mentioned that was really useful was about the remote proctoring software. And so now incorporating that into how he teaches his courses going forward. Obviously, a couple of our colleagues reworked, talked about how they reworked their um, syllabi to front load the work at the very beginning and then leave something a little bit more lighthearted um, for the end of the semester where they would see the applications that they learned in the very beginning, but in a more um, lighthearted form, I guess is the word. Did I miss anything, everyone, group one? Is there something that, all righty. They seem pretty happy about that report back. So Diana, thank you so much for uh, reporting back on those. And you know, if you look through that, uh, if you look through that document, and another great reason these note catchers work really well is that everybody can kind of review and see what's going on. You know, there's a lot of good, you know, kind of positive energy on stuff that that's that worked out that was nice for students and, and for us and for those of us teaching courses uh, to you know work with as well. I think that whether it's the informal breakout room chats, whether it's just, you know, opportunities to, you know, check in, opportunities to, you know, kind of have those social connections, uh, or whether it's just mixing the kind of modes of delivery so that students can access the information. All of these things, you know, end up working out pretty well and, and are pretty nice for us to, to have been able to continue to do some, some really interesting and some really, you know, good teaching, uh, just even though we had very different situations, each one of us had a different constraint and different things that we can do. So thank you for that report back. We will have other opportunities to report back from breakout rooms and you'll have different groups the next time around, but we're going to move to a different activity next. And this is something called a jam board. Quick, who's done a jam board before? Anyone wanna, okay, a few, all right. So maybe half and half, not counting the, the folks not on camera right now. So I'm gonna show you the jam board first just because it can be a little bit uh, confusing. Then I'm gonna give you the link and you're gonna make these edits. So here is the Jamboard here. 
So this is a Google product, one of the many Google products. And you can see it on my screen here. And I've got two different boards, essentially. Imagine a whiteboard in a conference room, same idea, except for the whiteboard is on your computer. Isn't technology magical? So this uh, has two different questions on here. So on the board, creating sticky notes. So there's a whole panel on the left-hand side here. You can create sticky notes in many different colors. So we we uh, Google sprung for the multicolor pack. Uh, you can insert text. You can insert images. You can draw. Be creative about it. It's a lot of fun. Two different questions on these boards. What and this is so we went from success. We were like, what was good? The opposite side of that is failures. What didn't work? And trying to channel our inner Rumsfeld here of known failures, known knowns, things we knew weren't going to work. And then in the second board, you can flip between the two boards at the top. Surprising failures. So things we didn't know weren't going to work. So on these two boards, I want you to throw text, sticky notes, anything you can do uh, or anything you want to do to kind of talk about these failures, because these are the things that I learned so much from these, the things that didn't work, whether I expected them to or not. So one example, and I'll just write this up so you can see how this was work. Um, we used a, uh, a uh, virtual machine. Uh, for all of our GIS uh, this year, and it despised grid files, the kind of stock Esri raster format. It ate them up and spit them out, and students and I were surprised and frustrated because we couldn't use them, and that's you know some of our default data. Unexpected failure. So I'm going to give you this link now, and for the next few minutes, we can just all work together on this Jamboard. Here is that link now. So that link is in the chat. Again, on this Jamboard, there are two pages. One is anticipated or known failures. One is unanticipated or surprising failures. One note about how the Jamboard works. If everyone's making sticky notes at the same time, they'll all tend to be created in the same spot. So if you make something and it disappears, just shuffle through everyone else's sticky notes and it'll be down there someplace. So we will work on this for a couple minutes as things are built up. Eric and I might organize, move them around a little bit, but feel free to move them around on your own. We'll take a couple minutes of this and then we'll discuss what's going on on these boards. So I'll be quiet now so you can think. So uh, I'm going to share this Jamboard that we've got. As I said, keep adding stuff, keep putting things on here. Might do a little bit of uh, you know light organization as we talk through this, but uh, I'm kind of curious. So here we are on the anticipated failures board. Uh, some of these things certainly feel familiar to me. Love to hear uh, any thoughts or reflections or expansions on any of these uh, topics or things that popped up on here. Anyone wanna talk more about any of these anticipated failures you put on the board? Hi, this is Dan. Can you hear me first? I can hear you, I think we all can. All right. Yeah, so I wrote the two at the top, not requiring students to turn on their cameras. Mm -hmm. Unsurprisingly meant that most students checked out 100%. Um, my wife, who also teaches at AM, did a different strategy where she required everybody to have their camera on all the time. Mm -hmm. And she had much better success with uh, in class participation. And then I was expecting having to handhold students with their weird laptops and getting ArcGIS set up to be terrible. And it was. <laughs> so, as expected, it was awful. Yeah, I think that I could probably stack a few of these sticky notes here, right? Uh, instructions to install, getting things installed. This uh, tech support is probably another one. Um, that's a little bit different access to software. Thank you, whoever was moving that with me. Uh, yeah, and that was that was something that uh, that was something that hit with me was, you know, a hundred or so students in Intro GIS meant 
a hundred different computing systems to deal with, a hundred different setups to try to manage. And sometimes it worked well, uh, and we were able to get there. Sometimes it didn't. Uh, the thing that surprised me the most was, you know, some students who just had, you know, they didn't have the system, they didn't have the internet, all these kind of issues, but they still fought through. I had a student who did the whole course remote controlling a TA's computer on Zoom. That's how they did it the whole time was just through remote control. And I was amazed, but I've always felt like there should have been a, an, an easier way. So uh, thank you for uh, sharing those and for getting those linked. Any other comments or topics on here, kind of anticipated failures that folks want to share about or, or discuss a little bit more in depth? Make a big gold star by this mental health issues one that just popped up while we're here. I'm actually curious myself about uh, not being able to read the room during lectures. Did anybody have a solution to that? Because I, I experienced this exact same thing is that, you know, under general circumstances, you can kind of sense you know, the shift in the room when you hit a concept that they don't quite grasp, and then you can kind of revisit it. And in Zoom, even when many of the video cameras are on, uh, it, it, it's, it's just too hard to tell uh, in the, in the little, little squares. So did, did anybody have a digital solution in, you know, the online teaching setting of figuring out, like, like, did you try polls? Did you try, you know, does, does somebody have some secret sauce for this one? I don't know how I was the one who put that one and I don't know how terribly successful it was, but there were times when I would say to people, I would say, is everyone getting this, you know, is this, are people good? Do they have trouble? And like, there would still be no response. And I would say, I am literally asking you a question, like, how are you doing with this? Should I continue, you know, like, is everyone, mm -hmm. and then you would get like, either someone would like, people would just do thumbs up or people would, you know, come, would, would say, no, I'm not quite getting it. So, I, I mean, occasionally it was just like pausing. I mean, I feel I probably should have done this, but I've heard of, you know, kind of like an unconference solution is the like red light, green light thing, you know, where people can kind of uh, uh, hold up a card or just do thumbs up or, you know, or this or down to indicate faster or slower. And you could just like, if you, you could ask for that as a check or tell people to do it with reactions, you know, as like a, yeah, I'm getting it or I'm not getting it. But I didn't actually do that. I just did what I said, which is say, that was literally a question to you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I tried pushing the same thing and I, I'd, have a, I'd have a handful, right? That would be, which was extremely useful actually. They would actually tell me, you know, no, I don't get this. And then two other people might pipe up and there were kind of the same small handful of people, but it at least allowed me to get a little bit of a sense. But then later on, I would find out that there was another handful that either got it when the small group said no or vice versa or whatever. So, but no, that, that's helpful. Can I just I really... chime in? Oh, please. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, a lot of what um, Lee said, I tried. Um, but one thing I discovered towards the end, uh, unfortunately, of the semester is that um, a lot of students just were quiet and I had no clue what they were doing. And at SU, we're not allowed to insist that people turn on their videos because um, you know, it might embarrass people, you know, home lives, all that kind of stuff. So, but what I did realize was in chat, you can make it, I'm so stupid, uh, you can make it just private so that they could privately chat me, right? And so you make it that whoever put the chat in, it would only come to me, it would never go to everyone. And once I told them, okay, if you put something in chat, it's only going to be seen by me. And then I got a lot more response from the students and people were much happier asking questions and things like that. So that's something I, I wish I'd known earlier. Um, I, I could say I, when I'm working with students in class online, I ask them to give me the thumbs up and thumbs down. And that just even from as a reaction, that really seems to help but I don't know if they're actually doing it in particular, if they have their, um, their cameras off, but I have 
require cameras to be on when we have gas speakers. I said, don't come if you're not going to have your camera on because people are donating their time to come and, and talk. And that then I've had really good response and um, the guest lectures are popular. And I, I think that requiring cameras on, like Dan was saying, is is really important. And I've actually had that in feedback from students, course feedback, telling me I should have done it all semester. Hmm. I see uh, Dan's comment over there in chat about um, controlling students having chat amongst themselves. And I think the whole chat experience is something we all have to examine very carefully, that there is a tremendous value in having a parallel conversation running in some circumstances. And then maybe there's the kind of situation that Dan's referring to where students were so distracted they weren't paying attention. But I think, I think if we're gonna keep doing this, lecturing synchronously online, I think we need to learn to engage chat appropriately because I think that is a very important piece. And it's not them sitting in the room listening to you. Let's not do that. Let's do it differently. So let's figure out how they listen to you and they chat at the same time because they're all good at multitasking. And I think that enriches the conversation rather than uh, distracts it personally. But I, we, we have to teach it or we have, to, we have to build protocols or expectations around it, I guess. So Jane's idea of going to private chats to you, that's one, that's one good approach because then they're not distracted by everybody else. But I really think chatting amongst themselves has considerable value as well. Rebecca? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, so I ditched lecture um, and I had only breakout groups like Forrest, you set up for the, I didn't call it no catcher, but breakout groups had their own documents and then we they do a thinking question, come back to the room. And then I would open, I had small class sizes, so this gets more complicated. I don't know how well it would scale, um, but uh, I would have the breakout room list and I would just call in first person from the first group, then the next person from the next group, next person. So everybody knew they were gonna be called on. Everybody knew, but not necessarily what order, um, but everybody had notes to look at from their breakout group and they'd already pre-talked about it. The, the, the other downside to that is I have no idea if they looked at the lecture materials. They were supposed to do that offline. So I have no idea. But isn't that the, the ever going mystery of, of lecture materials and, and connections and whatnot? I have I've advanced our little jam board here to our surprising failures to keep us on uh on the schedule a little bit here so uh surprisingly uh a, a bit more content and whatnot so uh i wanted to show this off to everybody um and see anything that popped up any other thoughts on our unknown unknowns that got us here this past year or so of teaching lee what's up so I just want to ask whoever posted, um, students wanted ever more cookbook approaches to GIS. This was already a big challenge. Like what the, I mean, obviously that that is something I think probably all of us deal with. Like like how 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 much is the lab a recipe versus how much does the lab exercise inspire you know thoughtful interaction? Um, and I, I would just like to ask whoever said that to kind of elaborate on like that shift and what, how, how it made it was more exacerbated uh, during the pandemic. Sure, thanks Lee, that was my comment. Um, I think what I mean by that is the students really just wanted a video to follow. They didn't want to strike out on their own. They didn't want to 
try to explore anything in the software. They wanted to know exactly step by step in a YouTube video what they were being expected to do at all times when in regards to labs and things like that. And and despite you know having conversations around uh, transfer of knowledge kind of things, which as you know were already challenging, uh, they just became even amplified more loudly uh, as you know what I kind of ascribe to having even more challenges in their you know and not maybe the space to explore things where uh, they just wanted to move through the motion they just wanted to get that assignment done to know that it was done that it was done up to expectations and then to move on to the next thing I think the possible exception to that that I did have success with was assigning team projects and um, that might be a surprising success is that they love the team projects this semester because they've found out that they weren't having interactions with other students. And once that was forced on them, they really seemed to embrace it. Yeah, the, the uh, group projects part has come up a couple of here as, uh, you know, surprising failures. And I saw a note come in as we were talking about the different variations trying to manage you know the different groups sizes and whatnot i in my intro gis class i basically and this was when zoom didn't really make that easy at the beginning and now it is of choose your own adventure so we'd be in lab for intro gis and i'd say okay there's eight breakout rooms they're all labeled with what is going on in them choose what you want and that gave students you know a a flexibility um to be able to kind of control their own destiny as it were um but yeah, I think that the um, the cook, yeah, th these issues, these are really interesting. These are like, I don't think I'll need some time to process all of these to really kind of connect everybody's um, experiences here. Definitely empty office hours I can connect with uh, of not a lot of people coming by, whether it was to scheduled ones or I run a scheduler. I don't know if that's a, a share that's certainly shared with me. Other things that of note or can I can I make a remark about office hours? Please. I, I had completely different experiences of that between like uh, uh, over different semesters, and you know, one semester like setting up office hours and doing remote and kind of sitting there at the computer and like no one actually showing up, and this last semester just saying look, I'll make myself available, just make appointments with me. And like one student early on saying, okay, can I have a regular time with you? And I was like, okay, well, if you want a regular time, then I'm gonna make it office hours then. So mm -hmm. I set up, you know, like two office hours on a Monday and Tuesday each week. That student ended up not coming virtually any time, but several students came virtually every time. And it actually did end up being really useful because the problem I was running into in the main class session was that no one wanted to speak up. And but then because it was like, uh, you know, I don't know, because it was office hours instead of lecture, it was like their framing of it was completely different and they were willing to come in and answer and ask questions. Um, so I had better experience with office hours this semester remotely than I've ever had with office hours in person any other semester as an instructor. Oh, interesting. So, so Lee, the, did you had one semester of remote office hours that didn't work or did, and then a semester that did work? Like what was the difference? Or, I couldn't, I, I, I really couldn't tell you. I would have oh. to survey the students who did not come to the office hours this semester <laughs> that it didn't work. Huh. And, they, oh, okay. and I did I did have a lot of one off meetings with students that semester. Hmm. Right. So, you know, they were reaching out, but they weren't just dropping in at this random time. And some for some reason or another, this past semester, I had like half a dozen regulars. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, actually, I have a similar situation as Lee that uh, 
Um, actually, I have a quite empty office hours, but uh, I did actually a lot of work outside office hours. So students just send me emails, say, hey, can I meet you after one hour? I'm something urgent. I need to solve this <laughs> lab question. So um, I have been keeping like, okay, I can meet you after one hour or even, the, even though during the weekend they send me, oh, I got stuck on this. So please see me, like, uh, can I meet you? So I feel uh, before the pandemic, it's not that often, but during the pandemic, uh, yes, I feel like um, uh, the office hour is uh, random, <laughs> not regular at all. <laughs> so that uh, surprised me. And another thing I want to comment is the, the breakout room. So I did use breakout room to discuss project work during my class. And uh, I randomly select the group and jump into the breakout room. And I noticed that for some groups, they really discuss the project. They even share a screen, show their maps, and they're doing well. But uh, for a uh, couple of groups, they are chatting something else. But when I jump in, they, they, <laughs> you can see they immediately <laughs> start to talk about the project. <laughs> but I can notice that um, they are a little bit, you know, um, not much yeah focus in the class <laughs> yes the, they always would get quiet when i would hop in i don't know what that means yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it was it was definitely a, a quiet space so mm -hmm. thank you all for those uh feedbacks on those uh components thanks for putting all the sticky notes on the boards what i wanted to move to next was our next little note catching activity so i've got a new link i'm gonna I don't think I need to show it off because you've already done it. We've got six questions this time. Uh, so I'm going to put that link in the chat there. Uh, I'm sorry, not six questions. We have six breakout rooms this time. Two questions still. Six questions would be too much at this hour, whatever hour it is. Uh, so six breakout groups this time. These questions are about teaching GIS with our pandemic lessons intact. So uh, we have learned things, we have experienced different components. What does that mean our teaching is going to look like moving forward? So uh, with that in mind, uh, let me throw that link in the chat one more time. Uh, so six breakout groups, we'll come back here in about 15 minutes. I'll try to hop in on one this time. Don't get quiet when I come by uh, and uh, have fun in those breakout rooms. We'll see you in a little bit. And uh, I'll, I'll start with a volunteer. I was going to roll the D6 on, on Google, but I figured that it would be uh, nice to ask for a volunteer. So anyone want to volunteer to report back from their group? I can go for us. For it. Um, so one thing that I found really useful, and I know my students will in the future also, and this is just about the nature of work going forward, is the fact that we don't always need to be in person to have effective meetings, you know? Yes, it's for certain things, it's important to be in person, the face-to-face, -face, the handshake, whatever, you know, for relationship building. But once that's happened, you really don't need to be in the same room to get work done. So. In the past, my students have complained about the difficulty of coordinating schedules to meet together for teamwork and so on and so forth. And now I will just tell them, send a Zoom link. And you know, in the evening when you're sitting on the couch watching Netflix, step away for an hour, do your team meeting and then go back. So I will definitely be incorporating remote conferencing software into out of class engagements. You're right, so for, for me with my students and also for them with one another. Bringing in folks from elsewhere over Zoom. Big hit, yeah. big, big positives. We can't get away from Zoom, right? So we nope. might as well. No, nope. I don't think so. It's not, it's not going away. Uh, and I think we I hope we can make that positive. Uh, other groups want to report back. I'm I'm especially interested uh, uh, on the accessibility discussions that you might have had. Uh, so any other report backs want to hit on hit on that side of your discussions that you might have had? Aaron, did you want to jump in on that? Well, not to volunteer you, but. <laughs> sure. Or or... No, no, Karen, Karen. Oh, sorry. Karen. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Aaron, you and I are going to have to, you know, get our <laughs> names straight. 
because <laughs> we've done this to each other before. Um, we had a really interesting discussion right before we all went away about um, assume you have, let's say you have one site challenge student in your classroom and you are trying to teach some mapping. You're trying to teach your students mapping. How do you teach a site challenge student mapping in a classroom where you're teaching everybody about mapping? Not, you know, about maps for blind people, but just about mapping, you know, trying to make your classroom accessible and you have regular students and you have students who have needs. How do you do, how do you teach mapping? So that was just like going, somebody must have talked about this somewhere. There must be some researchers have done this. Anybody have any sense on that? Um, really quick, I um, Karen, I had just mentioned the this thing called the spatialcommunity.org, and I put a link to it um, on the notes. And they have a Slack channel where you know they have different topics that they talk about. So could perhaps be a resource for folks uh, to connect with others uh, and you know find out more um, things on accessibility and what others have done done about it. You could throw that link in our chat too. That that'd be super. That'd be super helpful for everyone to see. And, and thanks for sharing that. Reg Gollage did some work on that uh, at the at the end of his career. Um, and that, but that's the only name that that comes to mind. Uh, yeah, but that's that was for a site challenge person using a map. I'm talking about teaching everybody in your classroom, and one of them has an accessibility problem. Well, that's why that's why I put universal design in the chat because our courses should be able to reach reach everybody, right? Uh, in theory, at least. Uh, Aaron with an A, you were volunteered. You want to follow up on on that? Um, we had um, an abbreviated Zoom breakout session is ending now, truncated discussion on accessibility, but um, I think some of the things that came up were just acknowledging that one solution does not fit all and that multiple options need to be made available um you know whether those are are uh options with accessibility of operating system and functionality or different types of software um and you know this is this goes into kind of a bigger philosophical thing but the difference between teaching GIS and teaching a software widget and, you know, understanding concepts versus button pushing and those kinds of things. Uh, just in personal experience, I've had um, a variety of uh, accessibility challenges in teaching over the years that included using oversized monitors, that included having um, sign language professionals in the room to interact with students or, uh, and I think you just have to be open as an instructor to, uh, you know, whatever the accommodation may be that the student requires. And that just becomes more so whenever we start the discussion of uh, virtual learning. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of the work in moving things, you know, moving things on the line in the kind of air quotes was just finding, for me at least, was finding ways to preemptively, you know, work and anticipate needs. So for students who couldn't connect to Zoom regularly, well, they already record my lectures and have those all posted. For students who need, you know, all of my lab documents are uh, screen reader capable and, and so on and so on. So all, all those different things can be no, it's it's good work to do. Um, and just a final point on that for us is that it doesn't have to be, you know, we, we kind of have the the more frequent accessibility issues in our mind, perhaps. But one of the challenges I've run into, especially at a graduate level, are whenever you require writing assignments for ESL students that are not able to just come up with the, the English right away and you're wanting them to write under like a timed exam or quiz or something online, that can be hugely problematic for them. And creating a, you know, accommodation for that is really important as well. Maybe not in the way that we think about some of the other accessibility issues. 
Oh yeah, timed anything. The all my timed things are gone. There's no more timed exams or 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 quizzes or anything, and I'm not bringing them back because you know with all the you know with it again it's an access thing that's probably its own discussion and i don't want to uh take us too far i've got some zoom polls but i want to have another couple minutes chance for report backs any discussions or topics that have come up uh that you'd like to hit on lee so i'd like to ask a question which is because i think it's a, a potential answer to this um and if anyone implemented it Grisha had mentioned in the chat earlier, it had asked me whether I was using Slack. And, and of course, she mentioned this particular Slack community. And I've been interested in bringing it in because I'm, you know, in like a program that's very oriented towards workforce and the tech industry where it gets used a lot. So I'm interested in it both from a pedagogical perspective, but also giving students experience with it. So I would just like to ask if anyone has had any experience and want to tell me if they've used Slack and have any suggestions for, you know, it, like it, in a sense, like we're already probably using Blackboard, Canvas, things like that. Like, what can we? Do, what additional benefit do we get out of it? And how did you implement it? And how did it make things good for you? I'm going to throw that into our poll list. Andy, I saw your hand first, then Jen. Andy, what do you think about Slack? It depends a great deal on who the students are. So. Uh, oftentimes they have their own channels of communication they're going to set up with either smartphones, but uh, you know the more, hate to say it, but the more techie oriented students are going to glom onto Slack and make use of it. Uh, I had a group of students who were more social science history type students that I worked with and they just, you know, you'd engage, you'd send a message out and you get no response at all. So it wasn't something that they were interested in, in dealing with. but. To tie it back to the previous question, it is possible to have sort of quick links between Slack and Zoom. So if they're on there chatting with Slack, you can quick start a Zoom conversation as well. So that's sort of one thing you can put together. Great, Jen. I, I want to echo what Andy hit the nail on the head um, with Slack. I, I did, I have Slack in two different um, semesters of the same class. And there was a very techie oriented student who led the charge on Slack and he got everybody in there and they were on Slack the entire semester, loving it, working together, networking. I, I think one of them, they've one group subgroup formed a company <laughs> at the end of it. It was like, I, well, how great is that? And this semester, I cannot get them in it. And I, it's a totally different makeup of students, just not interested. But I also think it's that was way pre-pandemic, a couple of years before the pandemic. So I think they're all burned out and they're just like, I don't have to do this one more techie thing. I'm just not, I just don't care. I'm just not doing it. So it surprised me because it was a huge benefit to them. Um, it was like, they treated it like a lab. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's really uh, similar experiences. It's really fascinating how one student can make make everybody else uh, you know push along with something. Rebecca, well, I was just going to throw in. I have not used Slack successfully, but I have a colleague in chemistry who teaches the big intro course, and she used Discord um, starting last fall. But she got a um, teaching assistant to manage it. And they made that a big community building, teaching, you know, they were answering each other's questions, et cetera. But I think the key sort of um, building on what Jen said is having a, a designated, I mean, maybe even a designated person who is sort of motivating the interactions and curating it and that kind of thing. Yeah. That energy matters so much. We are looking at just about 10 minutes left tonight because uh, we've been in various sessions all day and I don't want to go too far into, well, I don't wanna go into overtime at all. I wanna turn it off at 6.45 Eastern and let us get off. So I've got some polls. Now, the goal of these polls was just to hit on some other topics that 
were either listed in the, the session description that, you know, we, we could, each of those could be a session description. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for the UCGIS Slack. That's a fun community for sure. That links in the chat. So a number of different questions. I've got six now because I added that Slack question at the end. So I'm going to launch this. There are six questions. As you're responding to them, uh, you know, just have fun responding to the polls. Want to have discussions or uh, bring up any questions that come along from these uh, as you fill these out. Uh, certainly, uh, I try to have a little bit of fun with the responses. Uh, so there are some fun answers in there in addition to serious ones. Um, and so that little poll called rapid education polls should be up and running for you. Um, Question five is especially meant just to be fun, but when you have education people in a room, thinking about education, got to think about it. I'll stop rambling on this as you answer. our voter turnout is just about 50%. So I will share the results. We will have a chance to chat. I'd also be interested in what types of, and just gathering some ideas on what types of activities or, or um, sessions, workshops that you'd like to see the education committee keep up with through this summer and into next semester. So if you have any thoughts on those, feel free to from in the chat. As I said in the chat, if you have concerns about my survey design, send me an email. I'm more than happy to talk about my survey design here. We've got a few folks left. I won't close this down for a couple minutes. So if you're still working on the polls, no rush here. Before we get to results, if there are any other comments or thoughts or ideas folks want to share, we are in our last five minutes here. I'd love to give some space to anything that hasn't been brought up or anything anyone would like to reemphasize here. The, uh, the question about the cutting edge reminded me, I just saw a movie called The Razor's Edge. Uh, which really has nothing to do with GIS, but the concept sort of applies that, you know, we're doing a balancing act here, trying to, you know, work with everything, all these new tools and pull them together and have a successful class. And it's, uh, you know, I guess, a, I guess a tightrope might be another uh, apt uh, metaphor for that. Yeah, I like, I, uh, you know, wanted to make sure to give give some space to that type of discussion in the questions. So, yeah, thank you. I'm going to shut down this poll in uh, 15 seconds. If you need a little bit of extra time, uh, actually, if you need a little extra time, send me a private chat, and I won't shut it down. But I do want to show off these results here in the next minute or so. I am curious on on the kind of question three in terms of the GIS lab for for any programs that are looking at going a little bit more online and hybrid that do have one of these GIS labs that aren't going to have students in them, you know, consistently. What's the plan for them? Are you, are you going to have them open and accessible for students who don't have computers uh, that can do the GIS work? Are they going to be kind of, you know, like have a 
TA lab monitor, are they just going to be open? I'm just kind of curious what's going to happen with these technology rooms that a lot of people have, or a lot of institutions have dedicated. Um, and does anybody have any kind of thoughts, plans? Space is always at a premium, so I'm just curious. Great question. We're trying to fight to get a new lab right now because our most updated GIS lab is 10, 15 years old. In we actually fortunately just acquired space. So we're in the midst of redesigning. So this is a active, <laughs> active question because we're in the redesign phase. Yeah. Well, one thing can, oh, sorry, Jay, go ahead. I think um, our class is going to remain in the lab, but one thing that our students mention often is that they find the, the lab most valuable actually outside of formal class time. They find it useful to meet there and, and discuss and problem solve in a, in a less formal way. So I would hope we would keep ours no matter what, but space is always at a premium on campuses. So. When, when we launched our, our uh, PSMs a few years ago, we decided to go with laptops and then we're able to design a flex room that has a couple of workstations in it for people that need it at any time, but it's still serving that function as being like a space that students can come together to work, but they're, but they're doing it with laptops. So, I mean, I think the big transition is gonna be whether you're going to like a bring your own device model or the school actually like having to provide and support the laptops. Like we're doing that for one master's program that has a limited number of students. If you start talking about supporting a whole bunch of undergraduates who may have machines of varying speed and quality, um, you know, it becomes a little harder. Um, but I do kind of think that like that portable device thing is, is we're gonna continue moving in that direction. I, I like that as a band name of machines of varying speed and quality. I think that's good. I'm going to I'm going to share the results and Jane, uh, why don't we go to you for a last comment here? Well, I was just going to say, so at SU, we have a ton of international students and we're anticipating that, the, that we might actually have a lot of international students who will not be on campus. They will be insisting on getting an online sort of um, experience. Um, so we're going to have to do that sort of being able to, to serve, serve up um, remotely. But we've also got a lot of um, lower income students who don't have good computers. And so this whole last year, we've had our lab open. It's on a special, it's on a card swipe. They can get in if they need to use it. And so we would have socially distanced um, students in there working in the lab. Um, just what doing it online as normal, but it was actually a really good experience for them because some of them got to know each other finally, and and so so I do think we'll still need at least in the interim um, lab spaces for for you know a diversity of students who might want to get together with others who you know who just might not have the technology. Absolutely, Dave. Yeah, I guess. Piggybacking on both of those concept, concept, concepts, I guess, uh, I, one thing we did learn is that we don't necessarily need to provide every student with a desktop and two large monitors to do GIS. So I think kind of this, this blended technology mode where students can wander in with a, a laptop or sit down at a, a larger machine with, with more, more real estate to, to view the results on this, um, probably something that'll be useful as we move forward. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that I could sit here and talk with people all day about labs okay. and computers and Lee, I want to follow up about the laptops and all of these are, are great things, but we have hit our 645 Eastern time wall. You can see the results. I've downloaded those. This recording will be posted with the rest of the ones that are bundled up uh, from the symposium this year. Those docs are active and will be living. Uh, we've got the jam board. Uh, we'll summarize those, get a report of some flavor out. Um, Thank you all for being here. Wonderful night to see everybody. Uh, always good to see uh, friends from near and far. We always get to see here at UCGIS. So thanks all for coming by. See you at the things tomorrow, though not really unless you're on stage, but we can cause trouble in the chat. Have a good night, morning, day, whatever it might be for you. And Thank see you. you later. Thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Thanks, Forrest.
Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.